Welcome to the first session of the OAH, uh, recasting presidential history, a roundtable on the state of the field. I'm Darren Dochuk, not Bruce Shulman, uh, though like Bruce, I've written a bit about the Cotton Belt and Bible Belt and Sun Belt, and as Bruce says, we are the belt guys. Uh, due to a scheduling conflict, Bruce could not make it here, so I'm happy to fill in for him. This panel was designed to coincide with the release of a volume of the same name, edited by Bruce and Brian Ballow, published by Cornell University Press, that grew out of a 2012 conference held at the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia. The conference brought together seasoned historians and fresh voices from a variety of disciplines and fields to explore how a longtime pillar of the profession has been one of its greatest taboos, presidential history. Over the last three decades, while the American public has increasingly looked to the Oval Office for policy guidance and transcendent leadership, historians have cast their gaze elsewhere. During that period, social, cultural, intellectual, and economic historians have developed and mined rich fields of inquiry, often at the expense of political history, and especially scholarship on the presidency. Recently, however, scholars working in social cultural history have brought politics back into their work while political history itself has witnessed a renaissance. Despite this promising integration of politics into the work uh, that examines cultural and social structures, historians have left presidents out in the cold. Bruce, Brian, and the contributors to this volume thus set out to bring presidents and the presidency in out of the cold. Theirs, as you can imagine, and as we'll hear today, is a difficult, multifaceted, but ultimately productive task. Now, before I introduce you to our panelists and let them take the lead in the discussion, uh, I'd like to offer just a glimpse at the ambitions that frame this volume. Bruce's assignment today was to outline this volume's central claims, and I certainly can't uh, be as thorough or original or colorful as he would have been, uh, but I'd like to shed just a little light on them uh, by splicing together a few of his words as well as Brian's words which appear in the volume's introduction and conclusion. Uh, I hope this will provide uh, extra impetus for discussion later. First, the problem. In his introduction to the volume, Ballow explains why it was that presidents were relegated to the margins in the first place. It was not simply social and cultural historians who reduced presidents to bystanders in the march of history, he offers, when explaining his own cohort's reluctance to study the White House. Several generations of political historians had self-consciously constructed an approach to their topic that displaced the presidential synthesis formed by the likes of Arthur Schlesinger Jr., which underscored the unassailable power of America's commanding chief. Ballow was among those who wrote against the great man. I had joined a team of presidential assassins, he admits, intent on taking out the chief executives around whom much of the century's political history had been framed. The ambush worked. Our triumph, he notes, was most pronounced in the field of 20th century political history, arguably the very period in which presidents were most influential. Graduate students, buffeted by a current of history crafted from the bottom up and trained by a generation of political historians who forged careers by dismantling the presidential th uh, synthesis, were discouraged from writing about the presidency. As a result, the presidency was just as isolated from mainstream political history as it was from social and cultural history. Ballow's, hence the volume's, main charge thus follows. Quote, it is time to take study of the presidency off the endangered species list, and it is essential that a new generation of political historians lead the way. Now is a propitious time to integrate the presidency into cutting-edge historical scholarship because we know so much more about the environments in which presidents operate and the structures that guide and often limit their actions and beliefs. But how should historians, inspired by this charge, proceed, and what challenges await them? In the volume's conclusion, Bruce Shulman offers some thoughts about the perils and prospects of a new presidential history. The perils, he admits, are naughty and numerous. 
Most troubling of all is the fundamental divide between what he calls popular presidential history, which is biography obsessed and reliant on anecdotes about the heroic qualities and epic villainy of the men who have held the nation's highest office, and serious historical scholarship, which embeds the presidency in broader contexts and wide structures of international economy, reigning intellectual paradigms, party politics, the capacities of bureaucracies and the federal system, the operations of Congress and the courts, the ebb and flow of religious enthusiasm, and shifts in gendered political behavior. The widening gap between these realms is due to vital differences in method. One difference has to do with the divergence between those who, on one hand, almost wholly emphasize the structural constraints on the presidency and almost wholly neglect the agency of presidents, and, on the other, popular presidential biographers who stress the character of their subjects to the exclusion of structural factors. A second related tension has to do with perspective and the end game of history. Recent scholarship, Shulman observes, reveals a continuing dispute between champions of cultural and social history who find presidential history hopelessly retrograde and those who make a case for its scholarly virtues. This dispute at once reflects a fissure within the discipline and a set of political judgments about the ideological work that historical scholarship ought to perform. While many scholars in social and cultural and even political history continue to demand and strive to rewrite multiple narratives of American history from the bottom up, proponents of popular presidential history, though not uniformly, continue to shore up the presidential synthesis and its top-down master narrative, which stresses the exceptionalism of the president, presidential office, and the nation they govern. These and other tensions remain as roadblocks in the path out of current difficulties. Yet, as Shulman underscores, the prospects of a new presidential history are bright, especially if we follow a third way, one that bridges academic and popular treatments of the presidency. What then, he asks, might this approach this third way reveal about the potential and not merely the multiple discontents of presidential history. And here I'll uh, read a substantial portion of his conclusion. Our assumptions here, assumptions animating the rationale for this volume, are that we want writers and readers of popular presidential history, a genre that has been and will continue to feature biography, to take academic concerns seriously that the next biographers of Carter and Reagan, for instance, will read the work of Alice O'Connor, Susan Douglas, and the other participants in this anthology. We also hope that professional historians will renew the history of the presidency and make the institution central to their debates about American economic and cultural, as well as political life. To advance that agenda, the contributors to this volume believe that it is time to erase the top-down, bottom-up divide. To be sure, the skirmishes between social and political history during the 70s and 80s continue to cast a long shadow. But one huge benefit of the professional turn toward cultural history has been the explosion of that false distinction and a new emphasis on the reciprocal interaction be between different kinds of political actors. The presidency offers a key locus for these interactions. For example, Neither bottom-up nor top-down models defined contributor Robert Self's recent book, All in the Family. In Self's pages, archival sources housed at presidential libraries and the institutional structure of the executive branch undergird his history of family values. The Reagan administration, for example, sits amid, amid rather than above a wide range of social and political actors, both within and outside the government. It channels and delimits the energies of social and economic forces, but is also buffeted and constrained by them. Self's book offers a promising model of how academic historians might approach the presidency. Second, while, students, or while studies of the presidency will undoubtedly continue to focus on the lives and administrations of individual chief executives, they can and should rely less on the tools of traditional biography techniques that stress the subject's distinctive attributes and rip him, and someday her, out of the fibers and wrappings of history. 
Instead, they might engage more directly with the concerns and methods of microhistory. While this genre, sometimes called new narrative history, often focuses on the lives of notable individuals, it seeks to embed subjects within their context, to illuminate broader structures rather than to obscure them. Biography, to quote one comparison of the two approaches, assumes the singularity and significance of an individual's contribution to history. On the other hand, however singular a person's life may be, microhistory finds the value of examining it in how it serves as an allegory for the culture as a whole. For example, David Greenberg uses the presidency of Calvin, Calvin Coolidge to frame arguments about both the development of American conservatism, challenging the normal periodization that locates the origins of the modern conservative movement in the post-World War II period, and the relationship between the state and media. Greenberg's study of Coolidge thus intervenes forcefully in broader discussions of the transition from a politics of parties to a mass-mediated politics of interest. It shows how so-called presidential historians might construct literary narratives that focus on the outsized inhabitants of the White House while still incorporating the insights of a generation of cultural and political historians. The task will not prove as easy as we have made it sound. Even the way the United States stores its records in separate presidential libraries points researchers towards stories of individual presidents and administrations rather than making presidents, the shifts and continuities and dialogue among them, and the relationships to broader historical forces central to the enterprise of presidential history. Recasting that history remains something of an errand into the wilderness. End quote. But rarely before, Shulman adds in parting, have the conditions for pursuing this errand seemed so promising. Besides the striking shifts underway in the presidency, occupied by an African American, soon perhaps by a woman, which demand reflection by social and cultural historians, recent currents in political history have opened up fascinating fresh takes on this institution, fashioning leads for others to follow. The payoff of a robust presidential history could be impressive. And here I'll leave the last word to Brian Ballum, quoting from his introduction. Making history whole, deploying that history as a part of a broader intellectual discourse that influences the nature of the presidential power itself, and narrowing the gap between the presidential history that millions of Americans read and the scholarship that chronicles the historical context in which presidents have operated, all of this will require sustained initiative. Although we do not have any formula for ensuring its success, engaging graduate students in this initiative is essential. If the next generation of historians bring the presidency back in, and if the job market responds positively, as I believe it will, the profession can look forward to reaping the benefits of its investment in social and cultural history. With a bit of luck, the nation will also benefit from a more nuanced understanding of its history as Americans continue to debate the parameter of the president's power. So there's much here already to consider, digest, and perhaps question, uh, yet that's not all. Uh, our three panelists will contribute to the, who, all three of whom contribute to the volume, uh, are also eager to discuss the new generation of presidential history and draw insights into the perils and, most importantly, prospects of presidential history uh, from their own labor on behalf of a third way. So I'll just take uh, a couple minutes to introduce them and then turn it over to them. Our first panelist is Catherine Kramer Brunel, uh, who is Assistant Professor of History at Purdue University. She received her PhD in history from Boston University in 2011. Her research and teaching uh, examined 20th century U.S. political history with a focus on the relationships between media, politics, and popular culture. Her first book, published this past fall by the University of North Carolina Press, is titled Showbiz Politics, Hollywood in American Political Life. Generating much deserved attention and discussion, it explores the institutionalization of Hollywood in American politics by tracing the key personal relationships, institutions, and government policies that established the foundation for a celebrity political culture and that made entertainment a central feature of American politics. 
Her new project examines questions of governance and political culture in the cable news age uh, with a focus, I believe, on C-SPAN. Uh, from the process of deregulation to the rise of cable television and the advent of the internet, this project will analyze the political origins, economic pressures, and cultural implications uh, of the 24-hour news cycle. Our second contributor is William Hitchcock. William Hitchcock is professor of history at the University of Virginia and director of research and scholarship at the Miller Center. Uh, he received his PhD from Yale in 1994. He has published widely on transatlantic relations in European history and on the international, diplomatic, and military history of the 20th century, with a particular focus on the era of the World Wars and the Cold War. His books include France Restored, Cold War Diplomacy, and the Quest for Leadership in Europe, published in 1998, From War to Peace, Altered Strategic Landscapes in the 20th Century, published uh, in 2000, a volume that was co-edited with Paul Kennedy, and The Struggle for Europe, The Turbulent History of a Divided Continent, 1945 to, pres to Present, uh, published in 2002. Published in 2008, uh, his book about experiences of liberation at the close of World War II, titled The Bitter Road to Freedom, A New History of the Liberation of Europe, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, a winner of the George Lewis Beer Prize, and a Financial Times bestseller in the United Kingdom. His most recent book is The Human Rights Revolution, an International History, uh, co-edited uh, and uh, uh, made available, published by Oxford in 2012, which features an essay by Hitchcock on the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and the evolution of the laws of war. Uh, he is now at work on a book called The Age of Eisenhower, America and the World in the 1950s. Finally, our third panelist is Alice O'Connor. Uh, who is Professor of History at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and the Director of the UCSB Washington Center Program in Washington, D.C. She teaches and writes about poverty and wealth, social and urban policy, and inequality in the United States. Her most recent publications include Social Science for What? Philanthropy and the Social Question in a World Turned Right Side Up, published in 07. Poverty Knowledge, Social Science, Social Policy and the Poor in 20th Century U.S. History, published in 2001. She's also co-edited co Urban Inequality, Evidence from Four Cities, uh, with Chris Tilley and Lawrence Bobo, and Poverty and Social Welfare in the United States, an encyclopedia. Before joining the UCSB faculty, she was a program officer at the Ford Foundation and the Social Science Research Council. Uh, her current research focuses on the changing politics and cultural meaning of wealth in the post-World War II United States and the origins of the Second Gilded Age. I'll turn it over to them. Katie. Thank you so much, uh, and I'm so delighted and honored to be on such an incredible panel with such distinguished historians and to be part of this broader project about thinking about the American presidency and how to approach it in new ways. Last year, during my first year at Purdue, I was speaking with a variety of different faculty in the communications department. And when I told a former journalist and a former presidential speechwriter, who are now faculty at the, in the communications department, that I was studying what I was studying, they all said, wow, how exciting that you're studying presidential history. This, these statements came as quite a surprise to me. I had never been called a presidential historian before. Moreover, as someone who has just recently survived the job market, I have seen a variety of jobs out there for different types of political history, but not one over the course of three years did I see something for presidential history. The explosion of new works in political history over the past decade has shown that it might be a good time to be studying the history of American politics, but if anything, this has come at the expense of presidential history. And yet, their observations made sense because I was telling them about my new book. And my new book is very much about the modern American presidency. It is about the shift from political parties away from a system dominated by urban machines and patronage to one dominated by the mass media that's, that's also centered on the personality of presidential candidates. It's about the emergence of the celebrity presidency, 
how and why a political style formed in California, influenced by the motion picture industry slowly and very controversially, eventually shaped electoral pursuits of the White House and eventually strategies of governance in the Oval Office. The book is about how entertainers negotiated with presidential administrations, from Herbert Hoover to Richard Nixon, to exchange their production and showmanship talents for personal power, social prestige, favorable tax policies, and new markets. Nevertheless, I would still classify myself as a political historian, not this idea of a presidential historian. And Darren's opening remarks shows this broader history, the broader conflict between social and political historians. And I'd like to emphasize uh, how, how relevant this is by pointing to one session from last year's OAH uh, conference. Last year in a state of the field panel on American political history since 1945 attracted a wide audience. It was packed, actually standing room only. And it involved a fascinating discussion of how to grapple with new concepts and develop new frameworks for a synthesis of, president, or of political history. Scholars on the panel and in the audience pr had produced exciting monographs that looked at how urban history, religious studies, histories of gender and race and corporate developments can help us understand political realignment and the trajectory of ideological shifts outside electoral cycles. The vibrant discussion at the panel showed how this new political history had truly captured what the panel organizer Matt Lasseter called a quote, more expansive sense of the spheres in which politics happen. And yet despite discussing politics at the same time in which presidents wielded the most power in American history, that topic was eclipsed until an audience member asked about the role of political parties or the American presidency, topics that none of the panelists addressed. Is this the reflection of the field or the panel, the audience member asked. The answer, I would argue, is both. And in many ways, it shows the tendency to think of presidential history as a dead field in comparison to this very much new and alive political history field, the necessary other, rather than part of this growing and dynamic field. And yet the demand for presidential history still exists outside the academy, especially outside the historical discipline. People are interested in it. And as Darren mentioned in his opening comments, uh, when historians have moved away from the topic, public intellectuals, journalists, practitioners, and popular authors have taken over, pushing the, the narrative focus of this intellectual pursuit even more into the realm of biography and elitist politics. The more as we, we as historians stay away, the more this non-academic, more romanticized version of presidential history will continue to, domi er, to dominate. And thus, we will have two very distinct, separate fields, uh, presidential history and political history. And this will really create a divide between what historians study and what the public knows about history. And this perhaps is why Bruce Shulman and Brian Ballow have really led this push to rethink about how we can study the American presidency. And I would argue that writing about, or that writing about the American presidency does not preclude the use of interdisciplinary sources, it does, and it does not obscure the use of grassroots mobilizations. Because in fact, I came to study the American presidency after first going through television and film archives and researching the local politics of Southern California. Though my book is about the American presidency, it is not a story of elite white men. Rather, it's a story of Jewish immigrants, African Americans, women, youth, all actively working to gain political power, prestige, and influence, and as a result, shaping the expectations and the functions of the American presidency. Just as cultural and social perspectives and sources have changed the way we understand 20th century political realignment and economic development, 
so too can this approach help us gain a more nuanced history of the ways in which the modern presidency developed and emerged as a product of this broader historical context. After finishing a book that attempts to do this, I would argue that the payoff is worth the pursuit. Consider the standard story about the rise of the celebrity presidency and the impact of television on electoral politics in contemporary presidential histories by non-historians. A recent panel discussion at the Kennedy Library joined people who could be classified as these presidential historians today, public intellectuals, journalists, former Kennedy advisors, and the head of the Kennedy Library. And as they talked about the legacy of Kennedy's 1960 election, a consensus emerged in the discussion around one argument, that the night of the 1960 television debate, that first very famous debate between Nixon and Kennedy, was the night when, quote, image replaced the printed word as the natural language of politics. Or as Don Hewitt, the television producer of the debates, remembered a decade earlier, that the first debate was the moment when politicians looked at television and declared that's the only way to campaign. That evening, he recalled, was, quote, a great night for John Kennedy and the worst night that ever happened in American politics. Did one night, one performance, two, one man, two if you include Nixon, change politics forever? Did that one night allow image to replace the printed word and usher in a dramatically transformed political culture? I would strongly disagree. Only after three contentious decades of political activism by Hollywood entertainers at the state and local level that began in the 1920s um, and extended throughout the 1930s and 1940s, did people across the country start to look at Hollywood, lessons from Hollywood in terms of publicity and image construction as a potential political tool. Over a course of three decades, Hollywood activists sought to redefine the meaning of entertainment in the motion picture industry, arguing that it was not a source of moral decline, but it could become a political weapon. By the 1950s, political scientists and the Eisenhower administration began to look to California to understand how national politicians could adapt to the technological, cultural, and spatial cha changes of the post-World War II world. As one political scientist wrote in 1956, to understand the new look in American campaigns in which professionals, quote, raise money, determine issues, write speeches, handle press releases, prepare advertising copy, program radio and television shows, and develop whatever publicity techniques are necessary for a given campaign, we need to look to California. California, where this professionalized image making, rooted in collaborations between political consultants and the entertainment industry, has flourished over the previous two decades, this political scientist argued. California, it seemed, held the answers for success in the television age, something Eisenhower started to realize as he brought in the actor Robert Montgomery as his television advisor, and started to rely on other entertainers like studio executive Jack Warner or actor George Murphy to help with his advertising campaign. Hoping to become Eisenhower's successor, John Kennedy also turned to Hollywood, a place he had visited with his father over the course of his childhood. His father was a former studio execu executive from the 1920s and really kept a close eye on developments in the entertainment industry. And with the help of his father and his brother, John Kennedy crafted a new approach to win the Democratic nomination. During his primary campaign, he capitalized on what I call a showbiz style of politics, as Kennedy transformed himself into a celebrity by deploying his personal version of the Hollywood dream machine to gain political legitimacy in a party still beholden to labor union interests, patronage, and the New Deal machinery. 
He beat out Lyndon Johnson, the most powerful figure in the Democratic Party, for the nomination, in part because he launched a very successful primary campaign that actively appealed to voters as, quote, Jack Kennedy fans. He then went head to head with Southern California native Richard Nixon, and the vice president capitalized on criticisms against Kennedy's celebrity style, and he constantly critiqued Kennedy's use of, quote, cheap publicity. Historians have pointed to a range of reasons why, Kennedy or why Nixon lost the 1960 election. But Nixon, as he thought about his loss in 1960 and then his subsequent loss uh, for the California governor's race in 62, he believed more than anything that it was his failure to, in, to uh, prioritize television and this showbiz style. He believed, Nixon believed, that Kennedy's superior television uh, um, image mattered more than anything else, and that was what made the difference. Therefore, as Nixon sought to capture the presidency in 1968, he followed Kennedy's footsteps. He hired television producers, recruited entertainers, and attempted to transform himself into a celebrity personality to appeal to independent and former Democratic voters. His victory created a bipartisan belief that a celebrity image, the shift towards showbiz politics, could serve as more than a distraction to American politics. It could pave the path to the White House. And the book that told this narrative, Joe McGinnis's The Selling of the President, that became a bestseller in 1969, reinforced this perception. It seemed that the difference between Nixon the loser and Nixon the winner really hinged on media innovation and this embrace of showbiz politics. Media technology had changed. Demographics of voters changed. And cultural values shifted over for over 40 years to bring a California style of politics rooted in the motion picture industry to reshape popular perceptions of the presidency, electoral pursuits, and even strategies of governance in which presidents have become entertainers not only to win elections but also to, to sell particular policies. This did not happen in simply one night. <laughs> Rather, it's a political and cultural transformation that has taken over four decades and continues to be a factor in our modern politics. I would argue that this narrative is a much more accurate and intellectually gratifying way to understand the process by which presidents have adjusted to the television era and the emergence of a celebrity presidency. This approach not only relies on sources and theories from media and cinema studies, it also brings in grassroots mobilizations as it chronicles how political outsiders gained power by asserting their cultural influence. As a result, this narrative about the rise of the celebrity presidency is also about deeper, more complicated changes in American political life. As a result, I purposely changed the subtitle of my book to be Showbiz Politics, quote, or, or colon, Hollywood in American Political Life, rather than its earlier version, Hollywood in Presidential Politics, to really underscore the point that the presidency is, in fact, a part of American political life, despite the historiographic inclination to separate the two fields over the past 40 years. Recasting presidential history as an integral component of American political history, rather than the quintessential other, can perhaps provide a bridge between national and local politics, while also bridging the divide between popular history, as it appears on the silver screen, on cable news shows and internet blogs, and the history fashionable in academic circles. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Well, if you want to get a, um, a conversation going at the water cooler 
or in the elevator or um, in the dry cleaner, you can usually start out by saying, um, did you see what Hillary said? Or, um, but that Ted Cruz is something. Um, or how about Obama and Raul Castro shaking hands? What was something? Interesting. Or uh, Benghazi. But if you want to get a, you know, stop a conversation, bring a conversation to a screeching halt in the most history faculty lounges and even some, dare I say it, uh, gatherings of historians, professional academic historians, all you have to do is say, I'm a presidential historian. And you'll find your interlocutors starting to back away. And I've been puzzled by this as a newcomer to the presidential history genre. With this really quite notable and, and I think very significant and in many ways regrettable divide between our interest as citizens, as voters, as um, activists in what the president does on a daily basis, in who would like to be president and how they plan to get into the office on the one hand, and our fundamental distrust of the practice of writing the history of presidents. I find that really puzzling. Well, what explains it? It's, it's hard to know. The book that Brian Ballow and Bruce Shulman have edited grew out of a conference at the Miller Center where I'm fortunate enough to run the academic programs. And it, it, clearly somebody else disagrees with me already and we're going to have uh, the voice of the president. It's uh, these thundering thumps. But the book grew out of a conference that tried to answer this question, among others, what explains the scholarly disinterest in presidential history and the public uh, uh, continued interest in it. Um, and of course, the book answered uh, it, quite quickly in the beginning and in the end uh, some of these basic issues. There are good reasons, frankly, why historians uh, as long ago as the 60s and 70s stopped being interested in writing presidential history. Uh, they grew tired of the kind of history that presidential historians were writing. Uh, they went out to seek new ideas, new sources, new methods, new interpretations, new angles uh, of, of vision, and they found them in abundance outside the traditional confines of what we used to call the presidential synthesis, a history of American uh, life that basically lines up the presidents and just goes from one to 44. Well, what happened when they were out there looking for new ideas and new uh, methods and sources? Well, history without presidents flourished. It boomed. Our profession has probably never been more inventive, more imaginative, more interdisciplinary, more dynamic, more unconventional today than it has ever been. So why go back to presidents? What's to be gained? Haven't we just, can't we just leave it behind altogether? Well, the book we've been discussing offers a, a hopeful claim about this question and urges people to come back into presidential scholarship uh, with a new set of tools and a new perspective. Ballow and Shulman argue that after 30 years or more of methodological growth and diversification, the historical profession is poised to look once again at the presidency as a, uh, as a subject. We have new tools that we've honed in our studies of society, culture, race and gender, ethnicity, economics, religion, ideology, and these can now be applied to the presidency. The presidency is a site on which some of the most interesting political debates in American life have been contested, so why not go there and examine it? So the argument is the historical profession's evolution over the last few decades, moving away from biography, moving away from studies of leadership, high policy decision making and so on, has actually paved the way for a rediscovery of the presidency as a subject of historical analysis. Now, the history that we're going to write about the presidency and about presidents is not going to look much like what Arthur Schlesinger Jr. wrote. There will be a change of style and tone and of sources. That's probably all to the good, but this book of essays suggests look at the new work that's come out using the presidency, um, but coming at it from a somewhat, a, quite a different perspective. And that's the rosy scenario that Ballow and Shulman offer. 
And indeed, the kind of work that uh, the scholars on, the, on this panel and the scholars that are, that are writing in this vein have produced is really interesting and really impressive. I've learned a great deal from it. Um, if I just gave you the keywords of the essays that are in that collection as an indication of the kind of work they're, they're doing, you'll see what I mean. Each of the chapters that we put together on the, the presidency are, are organized around roughly the following themes. Gender, narrative, social movements, religion, ideology, race, media and celebrity, agency and structure, and so on. It just shows you how far we've come and how far we're going and pushing the presidency beyond the boundaries in which it used to be kept in a nice, clear, tidy box. All right, so that's the argument, and, and I'm, I'm going to slightly dissent from it, even though I helped organize the, uh, the event. I don't see much evidence that scholars working inside the academy are all that interested in reviving the older genre of presidential biography. And that's what I would like to talk a little bit about. What's going to happen to that enterprise? That is a field that we have largely given over to the chroniclers, the popularizers, and the journalists. Probably our best young historians will never take on the task of writing a study of a presidency and, and that president's era. Certainly they will never do it as their principal dissertation work. Maybe they'll never come back to it in second or third books down the line. So what? The failure of scholars, I think, to write well-researched, well-crafted, thoughtful, sophisticated presidential studies that have a biographical focus is, I think, a terrible loss and a missed opportunity at the very least because it only emphasizes the fact that the academy and the public are talking past each other when we talk about presidents. So I don't see yet the evidence that the, that the scholars inside the academy are really all that interested in writing a presidential history that has an audience other than the, than the academy. Now, whether or not we care about that is something we should discuss, whether historians inside the academy working professionally actually care about reaching the public. We often say we do, we do a pretty bad job of it. So I don't know how much we really do care about it. I, I think we should talk about that issue very frankly. Now, putting uh, my mouth, money where my mouth is, I am trying to see if I can push back against the tide and cross, at least tentatively, build a little pontoon bridge across this divide between the scholarship, the scholarly world, and the public world. Some years ago, I was approached um, by a publishing house and asked if I wanted to write a book about Eisenhower, the Eisenhower presidency, and the 50s in general. I just finished a book about the close of World War II. It had focused a great deal on European displaced people, um, on liberated Jews, on uh, homeless people, on refugees, and, and it was a very difficult book to research, and I scoured local out-of-the-way archives, and it's very difficult to pull out from this chaos any kind of clear narrative. And it, it, you know, the idea of writing a book about a U.S. president, holy cow, it just seemed great. I thought, magnificent. Uh, there'll be you know, enormous sources that'll be abundant, uh, nicely organized in, presidential, in a presidential library. What a gift. There will be a basic narrative already in place, and I can be assured of a reasonable chance of having a wider audience actually read it, because it'll be about a president, and president, presidential history remains a popular topic. So I went into this project, on, which I'm now calling the Age of Eisenhower, under the same assumptions that many academics make when they think about presidential history. It's going to be easy. And I was so wrong. I was just profoundly wrong. Writing presidential history is not easy at all. All scholarly writing, of course, is hard work. But presidential history, if you approach it as a serious scholar and not just as a chronicler, is really, really a challenge. And I just thought I would share with you four things that I'm struggling with, and then I'll, I'll sit down. First of all, to write about a president is to surrender the element of surprise to surrender the element of surprise. What do I mean by that? Well, when we sit down to write a book, we want to say something new, something fresh, something no one else has ever thought of saying, and put it in a new light, and bring out new sources or new voices or new actors to the fore that people have overlooked. That's the whole payoff of writing a historical monograph. But if you start with the president, everybody already knows the story. And you know the story. And the narrative is absolutely chipped in stone. Um, you, you, you've got to, you, you know, so you're facing this, this sense of a, of a, of a, of a monument 
and you, or you have to start writing, make it look new. You have to make it look new, and that's one of the big challenges for writing a presidential biography. If you can't make it look new, don't do it. But the challenge is, what can I bring that's new? What insight do I have that I can freshen up this story, bring new perspective to bear, while also not making my subject look unrecognizable? That's the balance. I want to make that subject look new, but I also want to reassure the reader that this is a story that you'll somewhat recognize, but you'll see it through new sources and new lenses. So that's one challenge. A second, of course, is the challenge between biography and context. If you write about a president, you are overwhelmed with the power of presidential agency. Everything the president does is inherently important. And it's very hard as a historian to, to resist the magnetic pull of the president. So inevitably, you want to line up from day to day. Well, Tuesday was lunch with the, with the you know, Treasury Secretary, and Wednesday it's lunch with the Secretary of State, and so forth. And of course, uh, that's a very dissatisfying way to tell uh, a presidential story. It starts reading like a forced march through a, a sort of textbook uh, of, of, of great men. It's not all that interesting. But you've got to find a way to place, so you have to find a way to place these actors and these powerful individuals in their broader context. But as you, as you emphasize more context, you are always pulling against your sources in many respects. So you have to be a historian of the, of the times as well as of the life. A third problem, uh, sort, of, sort of a similar one to the second, but I just wanted to emphasize it, is you have to avoid or break away from the tyranny of the anecdote. The thing about writing about a president, especially anyone that's very well known, is that everybody knows all the same dang anecdotes. So your readers are waiting for the classic anecdote, but don't you remember the story when Eisenhower and, and uh, General MacArthur said such and such to each other? And if, you're, if it's not in the book, you're running the risk of losing the confidence of your reader, but if it is in the book, you're rolling your eyeballs saying, I can't believe I'm using this shop-worn, threadbare anecdote again. So you have to choose. As an author, as a stylist, you have to decide what's important to maintain uh, in, at, at, and what's going to actually hurt you from your objective of bringing freshness to bear. And then finally, the big problem that we face is, who is my real audience? And can I reach that real audience? I have an imagined audience of scholars and the public. But as I layer on more scholarship, more archival stuff, more granularity, more historiography, I sense my, my, uh, my public audience getting up and walking to the kitchen and getting another bag of, of chips and checking on the score of the ball game. But if I just tell the same old anecdotes, I know that my scholarly audience is going to close the book and think my career is finished. What a terrible thing Hitchcock did. Uh, so I have to constantly battle against this sense that my audience is divided. Uh, I do think you have to write with an audience in mind, by the way. I happen to be someone who believes in, in, uh, in trying to reach uh, you know, your readers. So these are, these are methodological issues that I think are part of the larger, larger problem. Does the academy desire to reach a wider audience, and is the presidential, a study of a president, a good format for doing it? I'm taking a gamble that it is a good format for doing it, but I'll tell you, it's really not easy. I do think, though, that it's well worth the risk. It's well worth the effort. A president is a really interesting person, because for the, no matter who the president is, because so many currents of, of contemporary life run through the presidency. So if you want to write about almost any aspect of American life, go to the presidency, and you will find it there. Uh, that's what's so thrilling about working on this material. And then the last thing I'll say is it has forced me to become a very different historian from the one I was not only trained to do, I started as a Europeanist, but also most of us start with one set of interests. And I have had to figure out how to incorporate the history of all of the things that a president deals with. So a president just doesn't, doesn't just deal with foreign relations, my, my wheelhouse, but also deals with a whole range of domestic issues that I had to learn about. So suddenly I have to write not just about foreign policy, I have to learn how to write about civil rights, about the Congress, about the press, about the Red Scare, um, about all of these dimensions that I had not understood fully before. So in a funny way, I do feel rather liberated as a scholar and a, as a historian because I have a chance to try to write upon the whole range of what's going on in American life. A, a daunting task, but a very exciting one so far. So anyone thinking about uh, getting into the presidential uh, studies business, you know, come on in, the water is fine. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to get better about not printing stuff out, and uh, so usually I'm the lowest tech person on the panel. And uh, 
Um, so uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, and and thanks to my fe fellow panelists. It's really interesting. Uh, just to hear you work uh, through our various approaches, and I think what we've heard so far kind of gets at the variety of voices in the room in very, very uh, interesting ways. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about my ch the chapter that I um, contributed, but also I do want to start out with a few thoughts about this project of uh, presidential history and what it means. First thing I want to do, though, is um, acknowledge the passing of Stanley Cutler, uh, last week, uh, and I, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, you know his claim to fame is in using one of the most important tools of writing any kind of history, the Freedom of Information Act, to make sure that not just what the Nixon administration wanted to see released, but uh, what was actually in the archives uh, was released from the uh, presidential tapes, which has actually been an important thing that the legacy that the Miller Center has picked up in. Um, documenting those tapes and releasing them to the public. I also want to claim him for history because the other day, I don't know if others, others noticed this, uh, he was memorialized on Fresh Air and in closing Terry Gross said, journalist Stanley Cutler. And I'm standing and saying, no, he's a historian. So, okay, in any case. Um, one of the things that was uh, uh, rather interesting about participating in this project uh, is that uh, at, the, uh, at the conference itself, with uh, very, very few exceptions, um, the collection of historians who were there um, all stood up to say, I am not a presidential historian. Um, and we're, I'm not a presidential scholar per se. Whether out of desire to uh, distance themselves from the traditional uh, political history or out of humility, uh, you know, of the limits of their, of their own knowledge. Um, that said, almost to a person, the contributors, contributors also acknowledge that at some level we're all presidential historians. Um, whether because of the inherent fascination of presidential politics to people like us who pay attention to these kinds of things obsessively, um, but also on a more practical level because as scholars who tend to teach the U.S. survey, um, our presidential succession remains a standard and very useful way of organizing the basic political narrative, um, if only because it presents us with an opportunity, a kind of a baseline from which to, that's very familiar to our students and from which we can complicate the meaning of the political. Um, uh, for me, though, it's also a uh, Presidential history, this sort of presidential succession, turns out to be a little bit of a litmus test in, in gauging where my students are. Not so much in terms of their historical knowledge, but whether they're actually paying attention, you know, whether they're politically engaged at all. I will use the presidents to see what they know of any president. Um, I have to say, though, um, uh, in recent years, that's gotten to be less and less effective as I I notice my students um, channeling their political passions in very different directions, not actually, not channeling their political passions uh, towards the presidents, towards particular presidents or the presidency or particular um, presidential candidates with the exception of Rand Paul. Uh, Rand Paul, uh, you know, I get the, 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 usually the young men in the, in the front of my room very passionate about Rand Paul and others a little bit uh, indifferent when it comes to presidential politics, even in an election year. Um, I, I also have begun to notice the um, sort of declining significance of the a presidency in the answers I get to some questions, uh, the most recent of which, uh, in, this was in, uh, in 2012, I asked my students if they could name um, presidents they considered to be uncontroversial. Just everybody thought these were absolutely great presidents. And the presidents they came up with were George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Roosevelt, not really knowing which Roosevelt they meant or that there was more than one Roosevelt. And the other, this was my favorite, the other completely uncontroversial president, Bill Clinton. <laughs> so. Um, more importantly though, despite uh, what we are now experiencing as the paralysis uh, stemming from divided government, stemming from ideological polarization, stemming from threats of credible threats of government shutdown. 
Um, and, uh, and stemming also from the visible shift from uh, public to private in the locus of power and control in contemporary politics. Despite all that, um, I think as historians, we can't help but be hyper aware that the presidency and who's in it matters. It matters a lot in ways that can have long uh, lasting historical consequences. Um, now, nowhere has that been more evident in our own times than in what we've witnessed uh, in the power of the executive to shape the response to national crises. Uh, put another way, who was in office during 9-11 made a huge difference with long-lasting consequences that we're still living with. Uh, nevertheless, even as we might admit to being presidential scholars, um, at least on some level, um, in reality, the core concepts and ideas about executive power and its exercise um, and how it is and ought to be exercised in a democracy, um, the core ideas that have dominated presidential studies as a field are not now coming principally from historians and have not been coming from historians for quite a while. That to me is really kind of the, the essence of the issue. This question of the presidency and its role in a democracy, it's a question about power and its exercise. And in stepping aside from engagement in presidential scholarship, we're ceding that territory to other people. And that's something we do at our peril. Um, that comes home very vividly to me in the recent um, uh, sort of uh, revival or the, or, or the recent, uh, I think we can say, invention of the idea of the so-called unitary executive and the way it was for a time uh, deployed in our politics and might again be deployed in our politics. To, to not be part of that debate uh, and discussion as historian is something that uh, we ought to be very, con very concerned about. Um, so my own chapter, um, I mean, and let, let me just say then, uh, part of the things that made participating, one of the things that made participating in this project so difficult is that um, part of the challenge for us is how to engage and takes, take what's useful from the existing scholarship, and especially the scholarship on presidential power and its exercise, how it is and ought to be exercised in a democracy, how to take that existing scholarship, um, engage with it, but also bring our own particular concerns to the table. In my own case, the significance of economic crisis narratives in shaping political and policy responses to economic hard times. Um, and that's, uh, that's the, the, the subject of my chapter, and uh, let me, I'll talk a little bit about that right now. The, the chapter starts out with a, a kind of a puzzle, a puzzle captured in a speech that Barack Obama gave at, uh, in Osawatomie, Kansas. And by the way, at the conference I learned how to pronounce Osawatomie. <laughs> uh, as a, as a, you know, a Northeasterner was not practiced in the art. Um, so uh, he, he, Obama gave a, an important speech uh, in, in Osawatomie um, in uh, December 2011. Um, it, uh, and when uh, Obama, he traveled you know, very deliberately uh, uh, and very consciously, self-consciously, traveled to the heart of red state America uh, to give what the White House built up as a major speech on the economy. It was set up to be a big, if not a defining moment, for the Obama presidency. Indeed, it was very consciously built up uh, as a historic moment in extensive advance work uh, from the White House. Um, because, as the White House went to considerable lengths to make clear, the choice of Osawatomie, Kansas, uh, by the way, they had kept the choice shrouded in secret. I mean, they kept the press waiting until two days before uh, Obama was uh, about to give the speech um, about where it was actually going to be. Um, the choice of Osawatomie was significant not because it was Obama's mother's home state uh, or the heart of red state America, but because it was the site of Teddy Roosevelt's 1910 new nationalism speech in which uh, TR had called, and here I'm quoting from the White House press advance, for a society, quote, where everybody gets a fair chance, a square deal, and an equal opportunity to succeed, unquote. Um, in that way, uh, President Obama would be continuing the practice, 
practice uh, of aligning himself with presumably unassailable Republican presidents. He had, uh, in fact, sort of been aligning himself with Eisenhower in his education emphasis. He had, of course, aligned himself with Lincoln at his, uh, his own uh, famous speech at uh, Cooper Union in the, in the, uh, in the primary. Um, in some ways, he had been pictured as flirting with Ronald Reagan in terms of you know, presenting himself as a, great, as a great unifier. Here, he's aligning himself with another seemingly uncontrovertible uh, Republican to make a different to essentially um, uh, make a bold statement, make a bold statement um, about the economy uh, to make the case that inequality was the quote unquote defining issue of our time and to lay out a stark choice between um, what in the speech and in the advance he called the quote, your on your own economics, unquote, of the Rep Republican Party and his own vision of an economy, quote, where we're all in it together. Um, in this, at least judging from the media reaction, the speech was rhetorically quite successful. It drew cheers from the left, um, vilification predictably from the right. Glenn Beck went crazy about this speech, saying it was just another example of the socialist, Marxist, anarchist agenda of Obama and his cronies. Um, and sort of in the, in the middle, uh, the New York Times said it came as a relief. The relief being that Obama is finding his, uh, his voice again. Um, but the president had another task at Osawatomie as well. Um, and uh, that was also underscored by the comparison with TR. Um, and that um, was taking place, we have to recall, this is the speech is taking place within the context of the past summers, the summer of 2011, um, uh, debt ceiling debacle, um, his own stalled jobs bill, um, an increasingly recalcitrant Tea Party, which is really, uh, you know, uh, showing itself to be a, 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 an especially powerful force in politics, but also amidst the emergence, as if out of the blue, um, of the Occupy Wall Street movement with its rhetoric of the 1% uh, versus the 99%. Um, in that context, uh, o Obama's job in this speech um, was to reclaim the narrative, it was to reclaim the narrative of the economy, uh, what was wrong with the economy and what we're going to do to fix it. In his own words, in fact, he and Michelle uh, went on 60 Minutes a few uh, months after making this, he made this speech. Um, he recognized that his first term's biggest mistake was the failure to provide, let alone keep control of a compelling economic narrative that would help put the country back on the road to economic recovery and reform. And here, quoting from Obama, when I think about what we've done well and what we've, uh, what we've done well and what we haven't done well, um, the mistake of my first term, my first couple of years, was thinking that this job was just about getting the policy right. And that's important. But the nature of this office is also to tell a story to the American people that gives them a sense of unity and purpose and optimism, especially during tough times. So in the paper, um, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is why it is that Obama, with his recognized powers of rhetoric and his actually his recognized initial mandate, uh, in the year 2011, three years after his election with the mandate, was still facing this dilemma and, and actually was feel, still facing this struggle to uh, take and keep and main, con maintain control of the economic narrative. Um, in the paper, what I try to do is to shift away uh, from explanations that focus simply on Obama himself as a president, in that sense doing presidential history as a history of an individual presidents, and instead to step back um, on, uh, and, and, on, and to ask how historical analysis can help us to understand Obama's challenge within the context of the emergence and evolution of economic crisis narrative as a tool of presidential leadership and executive-centered political power by considering the presidencies of FDR and Reagan. Um, both examples, uh, FDR and Reagan, um, uh, of renowned narrators in chief uh, who successfully capitalized on economic crisis to launch programs of lasting and enormously consequential uh, policy reform, uh, but, who, uh, but also who used economic crisis narratives to expand and reshape presidential power in significant ways. 
For those reasons, among others, um, their presidents, I argue in the paper, that their presidencies can be juxtaposed to help to understand changes in the presidency and in uh, late 20th century politics and political economy that can help to explain why the powers of the president as chief narrator, ch chief narrator uh, have been diminished at a time when they're needed most. So um, in talking about the presidencies of FDR and Reagan, I point to some factors that despite the enormous differences between these two as presidents, uh, um, some, some key things that the two of them shared um, as effective, uh, that made them effective narrator, narrators in chief. First of all, both famously commanded, uh, commanded the bully pulpit, uh, as it were. Second of all, they brought to the table um, a kind of a new economics, which is to say a way of explaining and a language um, for uh, talking about uh, uh, to bringing a new framework, a new analytical framework, the new economics of Keynes on the one hand, the so-called new economics of supply side uh, on the other, in the case of Reagan. Um, third thing, they brought a, a, a strong policy, a policy reform agenda to the table that helped them to shape a convincing economic uh, crisis narrative. Um, but um, they also uh, brought to the table a figure that I kind of, uh, a composite figure that we can think of as a forgotten man figure. A forgotten man figure to capture the hardship, but also um, to make uh, to create a figure who would be the sort of hero of a reformed uh, and recovered economy, an aspirational uh, figure. For FDR, of course, it's the unemployed but uh, ultimately prosperous and secure working class. For Reagan, the forgotten man was the beleaguered taxpayer, uh, this, the, uh, the stifled entrepreneur who would, with the reforms that uh, Reagan could bring a, a, a about, be unleashed and be freed to pursue economic prosperity in the future. But what Obama, and, I'm, I'm sorry, but what uh, FDR and Reagan also shared um, was the capacity to use economic crisis and economic crisis narratives as a way of deploying presidential power within the polity and over the economy, albeit for dramatically different purposes in two major ways. First of all, an invoking and substantially realizing a distinctive and sharply contrasting idea of the public presidency. Uh, now, the public presidency is one of those ideas I've taken from the largely political science literature. The idea of the public presidency um, essentially associated with the presidencies of Andrew Jackson and the tradition represented by Andrew Jackson uh, and Woodrow Wilson on a theoretical level. The idea that the president is uniquely capable of, of representing the interests of the people against the special interests. Within the context of divided government, the uh, presidency can overcome, overcome the, uh, the, the divisiveness and the cronyism of the Congress to represent and transcend uh, special, narrow special interests. Um, now, um, the, with the idea, uh, uh, I'm skipping ahead a little bit here, sorry. The, the, um, what FDR brings to the table with the, uh, with the uh, public presidency um, is not only a unique capacity to sort of use the tools of communica uh, communication um, and his own gift as the great communicator, as it were, um, but also to expand the whole concept of the pu public presidency um, to create a different idea of economic citizenship, a, a new idea of what it meant to be uh, uh, what it meant uh, to be the president of a truly democratic public. Uh, that embodied in the idea of um, the Economic Bill of Rights. So uh, FDR essentially uses economic crisis narrative as a way of expanding the idea not only of the public presidency but of the power of the presidency to articulate an ideal of economic citizenship in a democracy uh, going forward. Now, in sharp contrast, Ronald Reagan similarly uses the occasion of economic crisis and the need to explain it um, to introduce a very different notion of the public presidency and the concept of economic citizenship that comes along with that. From the very beginning, Reagan cast his own public presidency in a distinctively individualistic, 
anti-statist language of economic citizenship that could hardly be more different from FDR's idea of interdependency and economic rights and, 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 and close association with the government. Um, instead, and in sharp contrast, uh, Ronald Reagan's concept of the public presidency and his connection with the people traffic, trafficked in the idea of a shared grievance um, of the uh, oppressed taxpayers and the overregulated biz businessman. To the extent that he had one, Reagan's forgotten man was the heroic entrepreneur. entrepreneur. It was infused with a view of American history as a struggle for individual liberty and self-government and free enterprise throughout the word. Freedom, that is, from the shackles of government that FDR, among others, uh, had, uh, had created. Um, the second thing uh, Reagan did that, uh, that I argue was of special consequences going forward in terms of this concept of the public presidency was to use this notion, also borrowed from the political science literature, of going public as a strategy of pre presidential leadership. Using the occasion of economic crisis, uh, diagnosed as economic overregulation, to justify uh, a strategy of going public, going around the uh, Congress and appealing again within this framework of getting government off our backs, calling government the problem, not the solution, uh, in order to appeal directly to the uh, to the people for a program of economic economic reform. Uh, the second way that uh, where are we are on time. Um, the second way that I argue that uh, the uh, uh, the, the 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 powers of economic crisis na narrative were brought to bear by both FDR and uh, Reagan in ways that were instructive but also helpful for understanding uh, to us to, for understanding Obama's dilemma um, is in using the occasion of economic crisis to create an uh, an, an infrastructure. Uh, uh, an economic policy infrastructure for uh, essentially realizing their programs of economic reform. Um, but because I'm running short on time, I want to skip ahead to uh, the conclusions to talk about how this helps us to understand this question, uh, the dilemma that I started out with. Uh, Obama's seeming inability to garner a, an effective narrative of, of economic crisis that he can keep control of. Uh, keep control of. Um, so bringing this back, uh, essentially by looking at this concept of uh, the narrator in chief, the idea of the power of economic crisis narrative as a tool of uh, presidential leadership, we can see that the progression from FDR to Reagan has actually not in one, in one sense uh, enhanced the powers of the government but precisely in ways that undermine Obama's capacity as an avowedly progressive president to exercise the very leadership he's trying to as narrator in chief. That said, uh, in my conclusions, I point, uh, I, I, I sort of bring the agency of Obama himself back in to acknowledge that um, despite the fact that he faces a lot of structural impediments uh, because of this progression I've discussed, in the end, um, this history also points to uh, what's been missing uh, from uh, Obama's own narrative and leadership strategies as president, and in turn, what keeps him from rising to the historical challenge to use crisis as an opportunity for transformative reform. Um, one is that Obama continues to lack a kind of clear-cut corpus of economic theory and ideas through which to explain what's wrong with the economy, but just as importantly to discredit and displace rival explanations coming from the st still deeply entrenched orthodoxies of our, us, uh, austerity and laissez-faire. Laissez um, the second thing um, is, uh, uh, it, it, that Obama is missing is um, a sense of this, this notion of uh, the forgotten man, a, a broadly inclusive vision, actually a, a forgotten man or woman for that matter, uh, a broadly inclusive vision of economic citizenship that reaches beyond the parameters of his own conventional and rather static appeal to the middle class and all who aspire to it, to acknowledge the needs and interests of the politically forgotten 
uh, people, men and women, at the bottom of the economic ladder. And the third thing that stands out as missing, uh, based on this historical view of things, is a, a consistently elevated set of expectations for what presidential leadership, in alliance with democratically mobilized public, can achieve, despite in, and indeed in direct opposition to the structural obstacles, uh, obstacles in the way. Um, and I think I'll close with that so that we have time for discussion. Okay, we have uh, 16, 17 minutes here, and I'm sure there are some questions. Uh, feel free to address a particular essay uh, or ask questions, raise issues that address the uh, volume and the project as a whole. Yes. Great question. And Katie, if you can yeah. frame it for purposes of the camera. Uh, oh, absolutely. In ter the, the question is, where, where do elections fall in? How do we think about the election cycle? Uh, do we need to move beyond it, or do they actually matter? And I would argue they matter, uh, especially in my research looking at media strategies. You constantly have both sides looking to the other. What did they do successfully that we can co-opt, take advantage of? And in terms of how to apply new technology, how to reach new voters, uh, different ways of communication, there's a back and forth, which is why looking at, um, at media and Hollywood's uh, mobile, involvement in presidential politics, it's not one side or the other. Uh, there's a constant exchange um, in terms of people that they recruit to work on different campaigns and uh, this idea of we need to do, we need to be better next time around. So I do think that elections matter. Um, and depending on the particular topic, if you're thinking maybe about broad uh, ideological shifts, that might not be so neatly bound in four years, but they do matter in, in certain regards. I would argue. I think that you covered very well. My own experience is that 1952 is one of those that you have to really write about because it is so interesting and important with powerful schisms, especially in the Republican Party, that have to get worked out and have dramatic consequences for seeding, uh, seeding as in seeds, um, the resentments of the, the, the Taft wing that will surface again with Barry Goldwater. So you have to get that. But 56 is kind of irrelevant. So if you're at the issue of fighting against the sort of magnetic pull of these every four years contests, I think you have to decide when to, u let them, when to use them and when to say, you know what, this isn't what I want to write about in this particular moment. Yes.
thank you. Excellent points. Anyone want to address one or two? Yeah, I absolutely agree. The the idea that it does need to be nuanced, uh, absolutely. Um, and, and in terms of, there isn't a language for presidential history, and I think many of us talked about the dominance of it being focused on, you know, biographies that that has really created that that historiography that's focused on individuals, uh, not creating that language for the historiography. Great. Yes. Thank you. So the, the question was, uh, uh, or the invitation was for comment on how the uh, structure of the archives, and in particular the presidential library, uh, influences the writing of uh, presidential history. And I, I mean, I think Will really captured the dangers in some ways because it's the idea and the expectation is, oh great, we're going to have, everything is going to be so well organized. And in fact, many of them are. I mean, they are fantastic treasure troves of information and there's, uh, what's in there is about a lot more than individual presidents, it's about the office, it's about, it's a great way of actually getting at policy and policy history and not just about uh, presidential history. Um, that said, uh, partly because of their prominence, um, they, I think, uh, there is always the danger of uh, using that as your archival base and then not necessarily triangulating the way one needs to uh, in order to really get at the uh, really get at the full story. I mean we have to remember that to a, a certain degree what's in those presidential archives is selected um, and is selected in a way that has a way of possibly shaping narratives that uh, and is organized in a way that has a way of shaping narratives that we are, are always at least need to be aware of um, so that we don't too easily fall into the categories within which uh, that is organized. At the same time, the other thing I think we need to keep our eye on is, uh, is to be very aware as those presidential libraries are being themselves organized by recently incumbent presidents it's, it's important, again, bringing back the example of Stanley Cutler, uh, to, to be vigilant about uh, what goes in them and what, gets to be, what is accessible and who gets, uh, gets access to it. I, I mean, I will say I'm a big fan of the, of the presidential libraries. My experience with them was, you know, building on what Alice mentioned, is I started with the archives of individuals, you know, I started in film archives and I looked for a great example is Jack Warner and I looked at his mobilization in the 1932 election, his support of Roosevelt. I did not immediately find that in the Roosevelt Library so I thought maybe this is something that was just in Jack Warner's head and you know wasn't really on uh, Franklin Roosevelt's radar. So I actually, it, it was not there obviously um, in the Roosevelt Library just doing finding aids and keyword searches. So. I, I kept looking and I had to be more creative and I looked in terms of, you know, California politics and all of these different, there were different ways in which they were organized that did not make it so easy to find that material, but when I looked under California correspondences and then I found a wealth of materials. So in terms of how they were organized, it, does, it, it didn't make it as obvious, um, some of those questions, but digging deep into the, the, the DNC uh, papers that are there, those were really uh, helpful. Um, and in different uh, organizations in terms of by state and by individual correspondences, that helped me, but it wasn't obvious um, when I started the research in the archives, if that helps. Mm. Well, actually, that, the, the geographical distribution is quite interesting. I mean, I, 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 um, I have thought to myself many times that it would be nice if the Eisenhower Library was in Gettysburg, where he <laughs> retired, after all, and uh, is, a, is a, um, an accessible 
place uh, near large population centers, but it's not. It's in Abilene, and that means you have to go to Abilene and spend a lot of time there, which is definitely worth doing if you're going to write about Eisenhower, actually. So the, the geographical thing is important. But once you get inside, that's what matters. And the fact is, one of, I talked about the anecdote problem, the tyranny of the anecdote. Well, it's partly because of the tyranny of the archive. Basically, people who go to the Abilene and they read the Eisenhower library, uh, materials are probably going to read the same materials in the same order, and they're going to find the same anecdotes. Now, I, I'm not, this isn't the archive's fault. It's the historian's responsibility to say, hang on a minute, I want to read against the archive, read against the grain, look at new sources, go out into the rest of the country and look at private papers and other, other libraries. It's just, you have, to be, you have to be vigilant because the archive is so powerful and so well organized and so accessible, it can overshadow other, uh, other collections that, you, that are harder to get to and, and more time consuming. Thank you. Yes. The studios, like many corporations, are hard to get at, um, and I relied a lot on the Motion Picture Academy. Uh, you can't do those searches on the internet. You have to go there. You can only make 100 photocopies a year, so you have to spend time there transcribing quite a bit. Uh, and So they make it difficult in that capacity, but it is, again, worthwhile or worth the trip. And then there's a wealth of film and television archives. Wisconsin has a terrific one that, again, looking at at individuals was really the way to get at these broader mobilizations, uh, looking at advertising firms. Uh, that was another really key way um, to, to get at some of those particular sources. Um, the, the, the Wisconsin uh, Film and Television Archive is in Madison. Um, they're different, they're, the Museum of Broadcasting absolutely has some stuff, uh, but it, it's hard to get at. And the, because corporations don't like you fishing around. In Hollywood studios, especially those that were run by Jewish immigrants that didn't, didn't write well, they didn't have perfect grammar, and so they destroyed a lot of their uh, materials. So you have to be creative. I found that I just had to be really creative looking at the secretaries of different organizations. They would transcribe the different, um, what happened at these meetings. Um, the Screen Actors Guild, uh, that was difficult to get in. Sc uh, Stephen Vaughn, uh, um, at Wisconsin was able to get in there and made a lot of copies and also has those available in Wisconsin. So I'm happy to talk with you more about it, but it's really being creative uh, and getting new th these new perspectives. And a lot of activists who work on a campaign are very proud that they worked on that campaign. So they save everything, which is great. And that is the, the benefit of studying pre you know, presidents and campaigns, because if you contributed time and you felt that you were valuable, you want to save everything to prove that that you were valuable. So getting at those personal um, archives, are, it was really helpful for my work. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have run out of time. Thank you. And uh, let's thank our panelists once again. And look for the volume uh, in a bookstore near you. All right, have a good day.